with me. He's the economics professor at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, an extremely eminent school of business that collects Nobels beautifully. Uh, professor, first of all, thank you. Uh, congratulations. Many congratulations uh, for this. Um, it's the right subject at the right time, if you consider what we went through through 2008 and 2010. Yeah, that's correct. The work that I and did with Divig and by myself, it was sort of informed by the experiences of the 1930s around the world. But it turns out that the insights from thinking about those and what are the key features in the financial system that make it potentially unstable fit pretty much exactly in the in the post Lehman period. One thing that was surprising, of course, in 2008 and nine was the prospect of a bank run. We saw it with Northern Rock and a couple of other institutions elsewhere. Even where deposit insurance and deposit protection existed. Right. So part of the point of our paper is that because if you set up banks in the proper way, as opposed to a, a crazy way, they're still subject to runs. That's one reason you need something like the government to prop them up, and deposit insurance is probably the most notable way. It's a little better than lender of last resort to prop them up. Uh, in the Northern Rock case, it, it was it was a little more complicated because it wasn't just people pulling their, their money out. There were all kinds of um, securitizations, right. mortgages, and things like that that they were also using as funding. So the, the funding sources for something like that wasn't just the traditional deposit. In fact, that was the part of the point of the paper with Divig. It's, it's not anything about banks. It's about any institution that finances long-term illiquid assets with short-term deposits or things like um, swaps that require collateral calls if you lose money or extra margin calls, things like that. So we're seeing a bit of this now. Some of the major banks uh, JP, uh, JP Morgan, for example, Jamie Diamond, they've suggested that the post recent crisis bank uh, re reserve requirements are now too onerous, that actually they are required to put too much on deposit or in reserve. Is this a valid argument now? I mean, it, it could be. I think let me put it another way. I think the, the financial system and the, at least the banking part of it is in a much more resilient state right now than before 2008. So we're going to get some fairly big shocks as int nominal interest rates go up and we try to fight inflation and we do quantitative tightening, we're pulling liquidity out of the system. I think if we had the financial system that we had in 2007, that could break from this, this current set of tightening. I'm guessing that the banks will actually be okay in this period. If we see troubles, it'll be outside the banking system, maybe even directly in the corporation, the highly levered corporation sector. I guess if we take the depression and then we take the last few crises that we've had, um, we obviously learn from them and we improve to protect against them again. It's the unknown, isn't it? It's the one that comes along yes. that we don't know. So for you at the moment, uh, if it's not an oxymoron, what is the unknown that you don't know that you're worried about? Actually, quantitative tightening that I just mentioned, we've never really tried it before. We hadn't really tried quantitative easing, where the government was just buying, buying, buying um, long-term bonds in huge quantities and pulling them off the balance sheets of the, of the private financial sector. And now, to unwind that, we're going to be at least maturing, if not maturing out, if not selling those back into the market. And the question is, is the withdrawal of liquidity going to leave the financial system in a trickier state than, than we, we estimate? And we sort of have to use guesses and theory, essentially, to do it because we don't have past experience. The other thing that I'm worried about is just the fact that there, the, there's so many what are called leverage loans out there, firms that issued um, loans that are that are highly levered, that are highly risky. And I've been worrying for a while that, that, that if there's a big enough shock, those firms, when they can't refinance those loans, could by themselves get in lots of trouble that could spread throughout the economy. Fundamentally, do you see current systemic risk? Well, I guess 
when you, we're talk, you were almost talking about the unknown unknowns, there's always going to be some systemic risk just because the, the economy as a whole, you know, has refinances its claims on all of the plant and equipment more frequently than the plant and equipment pay off. So if everybody tried to ask for their money back, they couldn't possibly get it. So it's always going to be a possibility that there's going to be a systemic risk. If we knew exactly what it was in advance, we clearly wouldn't put money into something that was going to cause trouble. It's the fact that there's certain parts that we can't predict is the fact that, that that's the prediction. There's always going right. to be a financial crisis, and it's usually going to be in a fairly unexpected place. But if we have proper regulation and resiliency, that happens, you know, one time in 50 years rather than, you know, 30 times in 50 years. Professor, I'm grateful. Congratulations again. Thank you so much, sir, for, for talking to us tonight. Thank you. My pleasure.